morning, Mercy Hill Church. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning to share uh, this message. Uh, this message comes from a place of prayer from the leadership of Mercy Hill Church, the direction that Mercy Hill believes that the Holy Spirit is leading us as a body. This message also comes with a lot of prayer of myself personally for discernment and wisdom as I deal with this passage. This passage in nature is a defense and an explanation of something weird, controversial, and supernatural that took place. If you were here last week, you probably heard a great deal about what took place. And so there was a response to what took place, as there is a response today from many people to call the work and move of the Spirit that took place weird, odd, out of control, and the people who are participating in this move to be called crazy or possibly drunk. And so with that, understand, I come from a place of submitting to the leadership, eldership of Mercy Hill Church and trusting their guidance of what they feel the Spirit is speaking to this church and also submitting wholly to what the Scripture said. When I was assigned this passage this week, I made a point to myself to not speak anything that my study from the text does not say. And so there's been a lot of time, a lot of prayer for wisdom and discernment, as I've heard from different voices about what the Lord is saying in this text and what he wants it to translate to in the life and function of Mercy Hill Church. And so with that, let's dive right in. We see in Acts 2, and starting at verse 13, coming off this time when people were speaking in tongues and and prophesying and declaring the mighty works of God, that there was a reaction to what was taking place. This reaction is defined as mocking. Verse 13, this is what they said. But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. Now I come to these experiences and what was described in Acts 2 uh, with experience on both sides of the equation here. I come to it with an experience of witnessing genuine workings of the Holy Spirit. In these workings, I've seen signs and wonders which bring glory to God. I've seen visions that gave peace for upcoming seasons in my personal life. I've witnessed amongst God's people miracles of healing that can only be attributed to a work of God through the Spirit. I've been witness to things called words of knowledge about people, directly to people, given in the corporate gathering of a church, where the person that the Spirit was designed for and speaking to broke down in tears. I remember occasion, a young man, when I was working in youth ministry, was a big, tough football player. He was about six foot five. He was about 250 pounds. He was a left tackle on, on the Division I football team at at the high school. But little did I know his family had gone through a great personal tragedy about two years before I ever went there to be a youth pastor. And it was through a word given that God brought peace to this young man. Without prior knowledge to what took place in his life, a word was given, a prophetic word you could say, that touched his heart. And so as it was given, I watched this six foot five, 280 pound, 14 year old man break down and cry in tears. That God took special care for him and spoke to him just what he needed in that moment. But I also come to this text as a witness of things attributed to the work of the Spirit that rightfully produce mocking and suspicion. I've witnessed foolishness attributed to the Holy Spirit. 
I've witnessed man glorifying theology that comes from this work of the Spirit or that people attribute to this work of the Spirit. I've witnessed people who seek signs as Jesus defines a corrupt generation instead of the one that would give the signs. And I've seen people use and manipulate what could be attributed to the work of the Spirit for their own personal gain and wealth to grow their own kingdoms and for their own benefit. And so like I said, I come to this text on both sides. I've seen God do great, unexplainable things that you can only attribute to Him. But I've also seen things where people engage in really heretical acts. Acts that detract from the gospel and they build false heresies and theologies from these things. I'm no stranger to trying to bring correction to those instances in my own time in pastoral ministry. But regardless of where we fall on this, if we're a little suspicious, if we're a little mocking, if we're wide open and we believe, yeah, we're all for it. Whatever the Spirit wants to do, we believe it's for today and it's, it's going to happen. It doesn't really matter how we feel about it. How we feel about it has to bend to what Scripture says about it and how it should function. One thing Scripture does not let us do, and specifically this passage does not let us do, is to approve of a move of God, or what may be a move of God, depending on our comfortability with what it looks like. There are certain personalities that are attracted to the work of the Spirit. They're more open to the work of the Spirit. There are certain personalities which are more hesitant to accept or receive or be open to what may transpire or take place when the Spirit decides to move on the congregation. But our personalities, our personal experience and history, and our presuppositions have to bow to what Scripture says about the move of the Spirit. And we have a perfect example of this that takes place in our text. This is what Peter does. He doesn't try to explain what took place on his own understanding or in the support of those around him. Say, look, look at everybody who, look, we have the majority here. It, People are speaking in tongues. People are prophesying. People are hearing their own native languages. Look at this. Obviously, this is of God. That is not what he does. What he does is appeal to the Scriptures and hope that those who are seeking God will see the truth of the Scriptures and that God will be glorified through the signs that took place previously. So let's look at our example of what Peter does when he gives his explanation of what took place. Acts 2, 14a and 16a. It says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now I want to stop right here. There's two things that took place in this explanation of the move of the Spirit. The first thing that took place that is significant is Peter stood with the eleven. Peter gave his interpretation of the scripture along with the backing and support of the fellow eleven disciples. Now like I said, I come to my interpretation of this text with the backing and hopefully the support of the leadership of this church. It's important when we come to Scripture that we don't just interpret Scripture through our own narrow lens. So we become an echo chamber and wise to our own eyes and ourselves and draw conclusions that we should not draw. There should always be a representation whenever the move of the Spirit takes place of the leadership of that body that they may discern what is spoken of the Lord and what is transpired by the Spirit to be affirming and aligning with what Scripture teaches and says. So Peter's standing 
before he gets to the scripture, has the backing, support, and authority of the other 11 disciples. He's not on his own in this. It's significant that Luke points this out. So with that backing and with that support, where does Peter take us? Well, he takes us to the prophet Joel. And he explains through the Old Testament prophet what has transpired. Well, what does Joel say has taken place and transpired? Verse 17, it says, And in the last days, God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. The significance that I see initially in this verse is that he starts off with in the last days. This phrase, in the last days, is incredibly significant for those that he's explaining these events to. The people he's explaining these events to are very religious Jews. They would understand that the last days are inaugurated or kicked off by the return or by the coming of the Messiah. These were Messiah-seeking Jews that he is talking to. And he says, the last days are here. An important point for us to note in our timeline of these events is the last days started at the end of the ministry, death, resurrection of Christ, and with his ascension. The last days began. The last days end with the return of Christ for his church to make all things new, to set everything under his feet, to judge, rule, and reign. As far as I know, Christ has not returned. Right? So if we take the last days to be the time from his ascension to heaven till his return, we have to ask ourselves, are we still in the last days? And the answer is yes. We also ask ourselves, did the hearers of this scripture understand themselves to be in the last days? Hopefully, if they believe Christ was the Messiah, the answer would resoundingly be yes. But Peter understands that yes, the last days are here. Christ has ascended. The last days have started. So for the hearers of this text, they are in the last days. For us, in the present day, we are in the last days. Now, if we place ourselves within this timeline and within this chronology, then it follows that what should take place in the last days should take place amongst us who believe that the Messiah has come. Well, what does it say took place when the Messiah came. A lot of people attribute the work, the working of the Spirit in Acts and in the early church, and specifically in this instance, as the work of the Spirit that works to convict, bring salvation, and then indwell within your heart to convict of sin, to glorify God in your life, and to teach you things. This working of the Spirit and the interpretation of the Holy Spirit coming, and that's what He was doing to His early church, falls in line with what Jesus said would happen when He left. Jesus said in John 14 that He's going to send a comforter. He describes the work of the Spirit. And none of what He describes would be described as this prophetic vision-having, tongue-speaking 
work of the Spirit. What he attributes to the work of the Spirit is what most of us are really comfortable with. Is the working of the Spirit within our hearts and our lives to conform to the image of Christ. To bring us comfort through trials and tough times. So it is very true that what happened in Acts 2 when the Spirit came and fell among them was that the church was initiated, that the church was started, and it was started because the Spirit was at work in the hearts and lives and dwelling in all those who believe. If you are a believer here today, I guarantee you that this working of the Spirit is taking place in your life right now. It is a prediction from Christ of what would take place. And the outward sign that that had taken place in Acts 2 was that these people began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. But also... There is something attributed to this working of the Spirit that makes some people a little more uncomfortable. And it is described as an empowerment of the Spirit. Jesus predicts in Luke 24, 29, he tells his disciples to stay in Jerusalem till you are clothed in power. Acts 1.8, he also says what? You will receive power to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth by this working of the Spirit. These two things can be true at the same time. The coming of the Spirit in Acts 2 was a sign that the Spirit indwells within us, works within us to conform to the image of Christ, that our lives may bring glory to Him, that it would help discern and teach what is truth. But also, the work of the Spirit can be attributed to empowerment. And the sign of that empowerment is often tongues and the prophetic ministry that takes place in the corporate gathering of God's people. Now, a lot of people say, well, why didn't Luke just explain it to those who were mocking as, well, this is, this is the empowerment that's taking place so that you can be a witness to all God's people. These people did not believe yet that Christ was the Messiah. So for him to explain empowerment, empowerment for what? To teach and explain and expound this God that they don't have belief in yet? Why would they need to be empowered to something that they don't hold to be true to spread? Peter explains the outcome of this empowerment at the end of this passage when he says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I kind of think of of this explanation in a way that uh, my buddy Zach sometimes talks to me about cars. My buddy Zach is a real, like, gearhead. He knows the ins and outs of cars. He knows everything. A lot of times he would invite me over to work on his car, and I'd be like, oh, what, do you need a do you need a tire change? Because I could do that. Maybe your license plate, you you want (laughs) to, we we could switch that out. But a lot of times when Zach talks to me about his cars, um, he leaves me in the dust. And, And it's not really necessary because I don't have an understanding of what he's describing. I pulled up a text from Zach of just one of these instances. We, we don't get to see each other much. Uh, he lives in Ohio. But every now and then he gets real excited about his cars. And they are pretty sweet. Um, so this is what he says. Just stick with me. Zach says, so I just pulled my L26 out of my Datsun with a cherry picker in about an hour. I'm prepping the RB25 DET swap to take its place to handle about the maximum that that stock internals can handle. I'm getting an upgraded snail, aftermarket turbo manifold, upgraded fuel system, coils from an LS7, an aftermarket intake manifold, and then getting return. For the new swap to work, I had a custom drive shaft fabricated, a larger rear end that is a vicious LSD R200 for locking under high torque. 
I've converted the rear drums to this, replaced the booster with a larger one from a later model Nissan, and upgraded the master cylinder to a Willwood one inch. All of the suspension is replaced. Adjustable coilovers, control arms, billet mustache bar, beefier sway bars. I'll be able to fine tune caster, camber, toe height, damper adjustment, etc. <laughs> this explanation of what he just did literally means absolutely nothing to me, okay? So when Peter goes on to explain in, in the rest of this chapter, as we, we get into that in the following weeks, you see the outcome is salvation takes place and people understand that the Messiah has come and that the working of the Spirit is for salvation and for sanctification that takes place afterwards. It would make no sense for at this moment for Peter to explain what took place in depth as, well, this is... What happened is for empowering. Empowering is for you to be a witness of the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. Just like I don't understand what the heck Zach is ever talking about. That would be fair. Uh, Zach works with me and I, I say, well, let's, let's put this in, in English. All that to say, I've updated three major areas of a street and track car. Power braking, handling, the engine brakes, and suspension have all been replaced. I've taken an old 1974 Datsun and updated it with newer technology. To that, I can say, awesome, good, great, man. <laughs> Sweet. But we have to understand, in this text, people want to flatten it out and say, what happens in Acts 2 is one or the other. It's the start of the Spirit within God's people to bring salvation to bring comfort and conviction that Jesus predicts in John 14. A lot of people want to say, no, 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 no. It's all about empowerment. People receive tongues. They're witnesses throughout the whole world. And because it's the last days, this is still going on. It's not an either or. It is both. It is that intricate explanation from Zach of what his car might be. But it's also the simplicity of, an understanding of what his car is that I can understand and give him praise for. I believe within this text there are some significant things for us to take away as a corporate body of believers and fellowship within Christ. I believe one of the most intricate and impactful explanations of this text takes us back once again to the Old Testament. You see, Joel mentions that this empowerment of the Spirit would come. There's something called the intertestamental period. It's about 400 years between Malachi in between the prophet of John. Those are known as the silent years. There's a reason we do not have any more books of the Bible between the time of Malachi's writing and between the prophet John arrived, John the Baptist. That reason is that these charismatic works of the Spirit that took place most of the time amongst prophets, sometimes priests, sometimes kings, there's a reason why that did not take place. Now, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, there's prophecies of great judgment. But with those prophecies of great judgment, there is prophecies of restoration of God's people. And it came through Jesus. Jesus. Right? But Peter doesn't use Isaiah or Ezekiel to explain what took place here. Peter uses Joel. And I think it's specifically interesting that he used Joel to explain what took place here because Joel is also prophesying judgment to come on these stiff-necked people. Judgment on these rebellious people. 
But within his restoration, is not necessarily that of Jesus coming. His restoration is a restoration of the prophetic gifts coming back to God's people. And so the restoration of this takes place from the time of that intertestamental period to now. The Messiah has indeed come because God's people are now prophesying. God's people are seeing visions and dreaming dreams. This is his explanation. To those who are unbelieving, he says, this is the sign that the Messiah has come. That you are hearing in your own language these people declaring the mighty works of God. He goes to Joel. He does not go to Isaiah. He does not go to Ezekiel. It is very significant that he goes to the passage that says there will be a return of the prophetic to God's people. And that return signifies something. But now that we are here with with this signifying of what that is, let's move on to the understanding of what the empowerment was and hopefully an understanding of what the empowerment is for us today. This takes me to Numbers, believe it or not. Numbers 11, 16 through 17, and then we jump down to 25 through 29. I believe that what took place in Acts 2, Acts 1 bleeds into chapter 2, is a parallel to what took place when Moses had had enough of the burden of leadership. Moses had been leading the people of Israel uh, out, of, out of Egypt to that promised land. And we know it took 40 years, but it should not have taken that long. A lot of bumps along the way. And on the way, Moses says, this leadership, this burden that you've placed on me, God, is too much. I'd rather die than lead these people anymore. So instead of God uh, granting him, some, sometimes the best prayers are, are the ones unanswered, right? Instead of God granting him that death, God says, I, I'm going to dispense my spirit onto 70 others to lead. So let's, let's look at the passage. It says, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you, and I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone." Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? I would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. If we need a little help in seeing the correlation, let me, let me break it down through a great quote from theologian Roger Schronstad. He says, In the transfer of the Spirit from Moses to the 70 elders, we encounter an event, an event which is in many ways analogous to the Pentecost. God permits Moses to share his responsibilities with the 70 elders. As a result of receiving the Spirit, the elders prophesy for the disciples in the New Testament and Acts. The ascension of Christ marks the end of their apprenticeship and the beginning of their missionary task. Confirming and equipping them for their new responsibilities 
Jesus gives the Spirit to them. As a result of receiving the Spirit, the disciples prophesy. You've seen the correlation here. In the Old Testament, the Spirit resided on priests, prophets, and kings. And occasionally on someone to do a great mighty deed for God. But even then, there were times that the Spirit of God was needed amongst more people than just a select few to accomplish the task that He had for Him. In this story... It's the 70 elders. And when the Spirit of God is placed on them, they prophesy. And when there seems to be issues with this taking place, because it was a little unusual, right? Amongst these people, it says they stopped prophesying except for two. And somebody says, hey, hey, this shouldn't be going on. Joshua says, stop them. I think many people look at the events of Acts 2 in the early church And if you understand your church history, you know there was a significant period of time when many of these charismatic gifts no longer took place. And they they draw significance from that. They say, see, God, God does not work in this way anymore. He doesn't use His people in this way anymore. And so it should definitely be forbidden. If it happens, we need to be like Joshua and we say, stop them. But I believe it is appropriate through our understanding of Scripture to have the same response as Moses. We would that all of God's people would prophesy and that His Spirit would be placed on them. Thankfully, through the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, this is exactly what took place in Acts 2. That the Spirit of God was on all people for this empowerment, for this prophecy, to do His work. To be his witnesses. This is often described as something called the democratization of the Spirit. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, 17 and 18 again and understand why it's called the democratization of the Spirit. It says once again, in the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour my Spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. We think of a democracy as everybody having equal participation, right? Democratization. That's kind of what we, we live in here in America. Everybody has equal participation. You can all vote. You can all play a part in, in what transpires. When we look at this passage, we see that everybody has a role of participation in this work of the Spirit. And by everybody, I mean this. It says what? Young and old, regardless of your age. If you are a young person here, If you are old and you think your time and usefulness to God has passed, you have to bow to what Scripture teaches here. It says young and old. Young and old, that's all of us. But then it goes on. It says sons and daughters. It says male and female servants. Regardless of your gender. There's male, there's female. You are in one of those two camps. The work of the Spirit applies to you. Women oftentimes feel marginalized uh, in our modern church and feel like they don't have usefulness because of certain doctrine, understandings, and theologies. But within those understandings and theologies, there's no forbiddance of a participation in this work of the Spirit. Male and female servants, sons and daughters, regardless of your age, regardless of your gender, 
This work of the Spirit is for today and is for you. But beyond that, it says slaves. Slaves and the other end of that is free. This is talking about social status. I think this is where many people come into this and struggle. A lot of times you won't let your age hold you back. A lot of times you won't let your gender hold you back. But you will let your social standing, your status, and your history that led you to where you may be in life, maybe a little farther behind, or maybe a less, uh, less in accumulation of wealth, or whatever it is, and therefore influence. You think that within God's church, this might have something to do with money and respect. And that's how God will use you. That's what you have to accumulate to be used of God. The working of the Spirit is not a respecter of social status. At this time, it mentions slaves. Slaves had pretty low social status. But beyond that, I believe it speaks to race. It says he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. White, black, brown. Wherever you fall on the pigment of your skin that God has gifted you with, know that there is no hindrance to the work and spirit of God. But also, there's no work and hindrance to the work and spirit of God. But I believe that if you seek out a body that looks just like you, on the basis of this body, I see faces that look just like mine. I believe you're in error, and I believe you're missing what God has through the work of the Spirit, through all His people. A lot of this work of the Spirit is uncomfortable. Whether you believe and buy in, it can be uncomfortable as well. The work of the Spirit is not about making you comfortable. It can bring comfort in times of despair and when you need encouragement. But if you're in in a first century body of Christ and you see slaves speaking out, you see women speaking out, you see Ethiopians, blacks speaking out, can you believe they were probably a little uncomfortable with that? But they bowed to what the Spirit wanted to do to be benefited in that local body. N.T. Wright says this, he says in Joel 28.32, we get this extraordinary prophecy that whereas up till now God's Spirit might be poured out on kings and priests, on prophets, and very occasionally on other people for particular tasks like the people who decorate the tabernacle originally. He goes on to say the significance is that now this has been passed on to everybody. That it's not just for this specific working, for these specific people that God calls to it. But it's for all believers to be open to and to participate in. So what is our response today? Well, I believe my desire and the desire of Mercy Hill Church is similar to Moses. That all would prophesy. Now, when we hear that word, we hear a lot of different things. But specifically in this instance, and what I believe took place in the instance of Moses, and throughout the rest of Acts, when you see tongues and prophecy... Oftentimes, what it says took place, and we see this in verse 11 specifically, is that they were extolling the mighty deeds of God. What is the content of prophecy, and specifically in Acts, the content of prophecy was not this, oh, give me a vision, tell me more about myself. Tell me something I don't know, Miss, Miss Cleo. It's not calling, it's not calling and, and seeking some, some sign for our own benefit. Tell me, tell me, uh, tell me the, the, the winning lotto numbers. That's not what prophecy is in this instance. The prophecy in this instance is speaking, empowered by the Spirit, extolling the mighty deeds of God, who He is, what He's done, and what He's going to do, and revealing His character. 
If you say, well, well big deal, I, I already believe. What, what's that going to do for us? You don't understand how sanctification takes place. Moses looked on the face of God and he was changed. You spend time with God, you learn more about him, and you are changed. Not, tell me more about myself. Tell me something interesting. Tell me some future event. I'm not excluding that God foretells seasons and events for us, but we're not there yet, and hopefully that passage will be given to Pastor Tommy or someone else. What I am saying is that I believe in this instance that this is available to all. Not that all must, hear me, not that all must speak in tongues or prophesy. Because Paul explains later in 1 Corinthians, does everybody have this? No. Is it okay that not everybody has this? Yes. The Spirit does different works and gifts each differently. But I do believe that this specific form of prophecy is available to us all. There's no hierarchy set up on those who may prophesy. I don't look at anybody specially who may do this. What I look at mirrors this quote from Sam Storms. He says this, he says, The gifts are not to signify anything special about the recipient, but is for the building up of the body of Christ. As a church, as Mercy Hill, as we move into these things, as we become receptive to the work and the move of the Spirit, there may be times where some people get ahead of themselves. They get more into their emotions and less into what the Spirit's really saying. And the easiest way to discern that will be that it, that it starts to be man-centered, that it starts to, to kind of puff themselves up, or that is some, something of despair, or doom, and gloom comes. That is when correction from the leadership will come. But I believe any form of prophecy that takes place in this congregation that is God-glorifying, that extols His mighty deeds, and that lifts our gaze to Him and results in praise, will be welcomed with open arms and will be affirmed. This morning as we begin our conclusion and come to a close, I would like you to place yourself within the areas of where do you fall within gender, social status, age, Whatever it is, know this, that the work of the Spirit, and however that takes place, is available to you. My desire is not that you would prophesy so much, but that you would be desirous of the work of the Spirit in your life, and that the congregation of God would be benefited through that. I'm not trying to work anything into happening. I'm not trying to manipulate. I'm not the circus director here. I'm not trying to work anything up. What I hope that has transpired and happened through the Scripture is that a desire and an openness and an understanding has been placed in your heart. And whatever the outcome of is that would be and that we would be obedient to that and to what the Spirit wants to do and say to us this morning and moving forward.